just stay, I'll just stay like this, like a president, you know. <laughs> um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us for uh, this uh, very relevant topic in our day and age. Uh, we will be discussing about uh, employment, uh, about the right of workers in the age of AI. And we will be uh, referring to uh, some of the latest developments in um, the regulatory uh, scene here in the European Union primarily. Uh, I am very lucky to be joined today by uh, an esteemed panel. Uh, we have uh, here with us Diego Naranjo, head of policy of EDRI. Thank you so much, uh, Diego, for coming um, to talk to us today. Uh, Aida Ponce del Castillo, senior researcher at the European Trade Union Institute. Hello, Aida, and, and thank you for bringing us all together. Mm -hmm. um, Simon Hania, Data Protection Officer at Uber, and uh, Paul Nemitz, Principal Advisor at the EU Commission. Um, let's start uh, with the introductory remarks by the panelists, um, and I think something that's top of mind for uh, people participating at this conference primarily is the interplay between uh, or among um, the proposed AI Act, the Platforms Workers Directive, and the GDPR when it comes to um, being effective at, at protecting workers' rights and in an employment context. So let's start with the introductory remarks on, on this uh, particular question, and then we could dive into um, more details. Uh, Diego, yes. how do you see this interplay? Um, are you seeing an inflation of regulation that might af affect effectiveness, or do you think that um, each of them adds a layer of protection that's needed, or there's something in between of the, of the two? Yeah, probably my, my answer is, is somewhere in between. Um, now I regret that I, I suggested to, to ask these questions. I said, it's a broad question, it's a tough one, but we should, we should uh, re answer it, and probably none, none of us has the, the right answer right now. Um, so where are we uh, as EDRI, as a, a network of 47 civil society groups working on digital rights? Um, we generally believe that uh, well, the GDPR has, of course, set up a great, uh, good, good grounds for the protection of, of fundamental rights for workers and people in general. Um, and we have seen some good uh, news on enforcement. That there's good case law by the report that Gabriel Sanfir uh, co-wrote. Co um, but probably there's still uh, some, um, some room for improvement. Um, we have another platform works directive, and I think uh, probably something between the GDPR and the platform works directive is going to provide a good uh, ground to protect workers and probably some um, additional guidance from the European Data Protection Board could help to see how the GDPR applies in, in, the, in the workplace. Um, in addition to that, um, the, the AI Act is going to bring uh, also some, some protections for works for, for um, um, one of the things that worries us is not uh, strictly related to employment, is the, the ban on biometrics and mass surveillance, and we hope that that is uh, deployed without any, uh, without any uh, exceptions. Um, so yeah, generally, since it's a very uh, quick remark, uh, a mix of all of them uh, in order to improve what, what the GDPR did, but uh, it is not about uh, over-regulation, but ra rather trying to fine-tune what we already have and have the, the best uh, possible legislation. Thank you, Diego. Um, Aida, and um, we know that in the AI Act uh, we have um, employment mentioned in Annex 3 and you know, AI systems that will be used in employment. Um, and I know that you have uh, written about this topic, so um, again, how do you see this inter interplay and uh, how do you see um, the role of the AI Act um, in, in, in um, solving this <laughs> interplay? <laughs> Thank you, Gabriela. Thank you all for being here. I'm very happy uh, to have a panel on the employment context because either you are all workers, <laughs> so uh, subject to a contract, or you will be working and subject to an employer, and data protection, privacy uh, are very important, and probably you would be using AI systems or not. Um, how will the employer uh, protect your rights? We don't really know. We have great 
uh, worker protection legislation already for many, many years in the European Union, great directives. We have the GDPR, which is also absolutely a fantastic instrument, and, and two forthcoming uh, legislations, that, regulations that, that deal with worker protection. The, the directive on platform work, uh, specifically on platform workers, perhaps maybe extended to other workers, and of course the AI Act, which touches upon em the employment context in Annex 3.4. Uh, I see a lot of interplay uh, in, in these three last instruments, but I, what I don't see visibly is how workers or employees can really exercise the rights that they have upon GDPR or the possible actionable uh, safeguards that they might have within the AI Act, if there is any chance, or even uh, the rights in the Platform Work Directive. Of course, perhaps this is a little bit more of a nutshell uh, in which specific rights that have been um, given by the GDPR are more or less transposed into this new directive. So there is a lot of room for, for uh, improvement. The specificity that we have in data protection and privacy and the context of employment is the subordination relationship. And this morning and yesterday evening in, in, the, in the opening remarks, you were talking about vulnerability. And one of the aspects of vulnerability being being in a power relationship. And employees are in a power, in a relationship of power vis-a-vis -vis employers. Are they a vulnerable group? Well, we can ask that question. We can reflect about that, but it's true that they are in a different level of subordination, hence they don't have to be uh, obliged to have an informed consent because this that cannot apply, it's not free. It's, so the context, in the context of employment, consent is not a, a valid legal basis. So we have the contractual uh, obligation, well, the, the, the contract that you sign with your employer saying I'm going to do this on you and you are going to do this for me, etc., etc. So those questions are still a little bit um, in the question mark. And we might have opportunities to solve it with the forthcoming directives and regulation, and perhaps also maybe with some, maybe, I don't know, guidelines from the EDPS, specifically on the context of employment. We have the, con the, the opinion on, on informed consent, et cetera, et cetera. So there are many ways in which we can have, make more improvements, and I give the, the floor to, to the next speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Aida. Um, Simon, how do you see this interplay from where you stand? Because you, you, you have to advise on the implementation of current law and future law. Uh, that has to do with, of course, uh, the scope of the GDPR. Um, Thanks. Uh Gabriela, um, so my, my perspective is indeed that of the data protection officer and the GDPR, um, specifically monitoring for compliance but also advising uh, on the law. Uh, and currently there's one law which governs uh, what we were talking about, GDPR, and we have two ones that are coming up, which means that it, at the current stage of the legislative process, people tend to be very much focused on uh, where they think things are wrong or uh, 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 there are mismatches. That's fine. Uh, but I'm already looking at if this is there, how would we make this practical and how would it work in practice? And if we look at GDPR, um, I think it's, it needs to be clear that GDPR, of course, applies in an employment or a labor context. It also applies in a contractual context, but it also applies to uh, consumers um, served by employees. So that's very horizontal. Then if you look at the AI Act, and I think it's important to realize that the AI Act is an act on technology related to products such that it enables subsequent proper use. So to me, the AI Act is a precursor to GDPR. It's an input to what you can use as a tool within GDPR, and both need to apply, while we also need to realize that, of course, the AI Act governs also non-personal data, which still could have an effect on the individual. So there are interrelationships. So to me, there's a sequence, AI Act, GDPR, depending also on the definition of AI. And the definition of AI is, 
currently very broad, intentionally, which means that the AI Act will govern a lot and will require the risk assessments in there if you are under the presumption and that list will grow over time, which then, and that's how I see it, helps with GDPR compliance because already a level of risk, ass risk assessment of conformity will have already been uh, conducted. So. AI Act, GDPR. Then subsequently, if the GDPR is, uh, is both are used in a context of platform work, whatever the definition is of that, but rest assured, Uber is one, uh, then the platform work directive will apply. Again, the data elements in that are irrespective of whether there's the presumed deployment or whether that has been rebutted. So we can forget about that for now, because also when you're not in an employment relationship, you have a right to all of the protections granted by the AI Act and GDPR combined. So it's, in my view, I can deal with it as a DPO from that perspective relatively, uh, 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 I would say not comfortably, but um, it's invariant. Then the platform work directive to me, and I hope the structure will pan out is kind of lex specialis or the article whatever in the 80s that allows or need, uh, requires national governments to enact law in the employment space, which in many cases already exists. It's not like in countries nothing exists that regulates this relationship. Uh, testament to, for instance, what the Working Party 29 already in 2017 has put in guidelines regarding the use of personal data and irrespective of technology, I'm quoting it, uh, uh, in the workplace. So this is how, for me, it, it fits together and flows together. And hopefully, we can make it flow together like that and not having too much, what sometimes what I would call feature creep in law. I think law needs to be done properly. I think the commission did a great job. We run the risk of, yeah, people, people now riding their hobby horses and adding stuff to it, which will pollute this nice flow. So that's, that's my take on it. So I'm, I'm optimistic about this. That's my message. I see. So, so uh, you are seeing more of the added layers. Um. I don't see it as added layers. Mm -hmm. I see it as a, as a flow. Okay. Uh, for uh, Paul's introductory remarks, um, I will add a twist because we have been discussing the interplay of, of these two proposed um, laws with the, the existing GDPR, but we have not mentioned labor law until now. And since we're talking about workers and in the context of employment, uh, everything technically builds on la uh, labor law as well. Uh, how do you see all of this working together? Well, I think it's, it's fair to say that <clears throat> in the development of digital law in the European Union, we are now turning directly and explicitly to the workplace, which is good and very important because whether democracy works and whether the laws which democracy puts in place really make a difference for people, people feel it if you, you know, realize how much time they spend at work, first of all at work. So it is important that um, people don't feel at work that they are left alone and that this is a space outside the effect of the democratic law. So I think from that point of view, it's, it's good that we now explicitly turn to a workplace which has become a little bit outside, namely uh, the platform work, crowd work, uh, all these things. It's a little bit the syndrome of, you know, like on the early internet, the Wild West, uh, unclear legal situation. Also models, sorry to say, Uber, uh, you know, trying to develop, let's say, fake independence models, uh, going to court uh, to show that they are not employees and so on. This is the new capitalism of this world where I think we have to show that uh, there is, a, first of all, a primacy of democracy and lawmaking. It's in, it, it has to be the legislator in the end which gives the rules which make people feel that they are more than just exploited workers, but that they are citizens and that the fact that you live in a democracy is something which makes a difference for you. So that's why I think it's important that we now turn more attention to the impact of uh, the tech business models and technology itself at the workplace. And that's why also we are addressing this now, not just with an action plan, um, um, but with hard legislation. This being said, I think it is not giving the right message to say uh, 
the workplace is also ad addressed in the annex to the AI Act. It sounds like it's addressed in a very unimportant way. The opposite is true. The AI Act sets out risk categories and using AI for recruitment, um, for vocational training and for work management in terms of performance assessment and managing the workplace is the top risk category. So, you know, it's not Annex 3, it is in the top risk category and what is the, the, what are the risk categories? Okay, that's in an Annex. But, so that means that the highest level of impact of AI, of the AI Act, can be found in when it is used at the workplace. That means for, for that type of AI, all the full package of the requirements for the high risk um, category uh, kicks in, which is a lot and which is important. And um, I would, uh, join uh, with the idea that this is important as an input to later legal use, but not only that, because it's not only about documentation, it also has qualitative elements. And I think it is remarkable that using high tech like AI at the workplace is called high risk because it witnesses exactly to the vulnerability and not only the theoretical vulnerability, but the day-to-day -day exploitation of workers in the new tech economy. I mean, let's not kid ourselves, the business model of Uber, what is it, 20,000 employees, 3.9 3 million, 3 million drivers, uh, which are not supposedly employees, that tells you, you know, the dream of making money on the back of people um, in a way which completely goes against the classic model of the employer taking care uh, of employees and which also goes, uh, uh, which is very hard to reconcile also with the classic models of social protection, union organizations on all these things which after the Second World War have shaped our democracies and on which the functioning of democracy relies because people exactly when they have such systems they say, well, democracy is a good thing. But if they don't have these systems anymore and they are feeling, you know, we're just at the mercy of the algorithm which organizes our work, you know, what that leads to, we have to be very, very careful about. So then my last remark is for labor law and for protecting workers and giving tools also to unions, it's not necessary that the law contains the word union or labor. GDPR is a good example. All the rights of GDPR can be used by individual workers, can be used by shop stewards. The shop stewards can bring in the data protection officer uh, authority into the company and they should do that. They should be great friends with the data protection authority if the employer doesn't play ball. So um, we need to look at the law in a holistic way and I, I would say that's my last remark. In, in the legal field of labor law, we have to start now integrating with labor law, data protection law, uh, and the AI Act and the, the Crowd Worker Act anyway is, uh, is labor law. Uh, thank you so much for that. And, and I would like to specify that it is not me who has put uh, high-risk uh, high AI systems into an annex to a proposal. It was the European Commission. So the only reason why I refer to the Annex 3 is because that's where the high-risk uh, AI systems are included for uh, the time being, at least. <coughs> um, let's dip, di uh, dig a bit deeper <coughs> into the AI Act. Um, I'm uh, perhaps looking at Aida to give us her perspective on the inclusion of um, um, the AI systems in the employment context on this high-risk uh, AI systems um, uh, annex. Okay. Uh, yeah. And, and okay. whether do you think that's um, uh, enough or would you see uh, something else as a solution? Okay. Thank you. And um, 
Well, as you all know, the AI Act is a product safety legislation. It's not a labor law a piece of regulation, and it was not designed to, to be a part of a pro worker protection legislation. So, well, that's it. That's the legal basis. I could argue then that perhaps uh, we can add another legal basis, and then the problem is solved. It, if it's legally possible, it's possible. That's not a problem then. Um, what is a little bit perhaps of concern within the AI Act, besides that it's not a worker protection legislation, is the fact that, yes, there is perhaps um, a lack of uh, clarity between um, what could be a prohibited use uh, in terms of work and what is a real high risk. For example, I believe that some uh, emotion recognition systems that are used in in finan the financial sex sector, for example, looking at whether the worker is empathetic enough with the client, who is a very high profile uh, person who wants to put some money in their bank, is okay or not, whether that should be banned, for example, or whether uh, teachers being mo constantly monitored by a camera and analyzing whether, again, they are being emp empathetic or not towards children could be a banned use or not. And because what is, uh, how can we assess emotions and em empathy of a worker or not? So there are several uses that perhaps we can start thinking whether they could be, be put in the category of banned according to the risk categorization. Then, my second observation concerning Annex 3.4, which is employment and vocational training, is that the two paragraphs, which are very nicely written, I think that they are describing mainly algorithmic management, the whole spectrum of algorithmic management, which is okay, which is absolutely fantastic, but I just would like to um, draw the, your attention to how the a white paper of AI by the European Commission was drafted initially. initially. And it said uh, that all forms of employment should be, uh, be highly categorized as a high risk. That wording of the white paper was not really um, copy-pasted, if you like, in the AI Act. It was more crafted as algorithmic management. And I think that there are other uses uh, that are not necessarily algorithmic management or people analytics that could perhaps be more explicitly um, described in the risk category, or at least to give an idea to the employer what is high risk of AI in a context of employment are, and why, what not. Is working with a co-boat in a factory in the automotive sector, I know Volkswagen is here, is it a high risk or just a safety risk, which is very high? Uh, when it entails uh, that the robot or the AI system understands uh, workers' patterns of how it moves, how fast he moves in the plant, in the, in the factory process, is, is, is that personal data? Is, is that a high risk or, or not? And, and how can we then manage the risk? How do employers manage the workplace risk? This is something that perhaps could be more explicitly said in the AI Act or somewhere else, because we don't know that. And according to labor law, managing risk at the workplace is not just the prerogative of the employer. It's a co-production between the employer and employee when they are working together to see how to assess and how to manage the risk. And um, this is a little bit, a bit fussy in the AI Act. Um, the purpose of the system. It's also very important to, to take into account for what it's being used in a workplace, whether an employer buys a specific software for one specific purpose, whether that's communicated to the worker, and to see whether the employer is not using that AI system accordingly to the purpose, or it's using for another, another purpose. So, Purpose, misuse, abuse, and lack of use, it's also a topic of discussion. Um, I can say more, but perhaps maybe I can uh, pass the word to, to other speakers too, and we can retake some of the points later on. Uh, absolutely. Uh, Simon, you, you wanted yeah, can, to, can to I, add? Yeah, uh, respond. So, just want to make clear, I, I talk about AI in the data, not about the labor law, but I take note of what Paul says, apparently, uh, 
something that European Commission uh, thinks. I just note that I'm also reading that various member states have different opinions uh, on this, so that's good to have that debate, so not a problem, but I'm not going to do it because I'm the DPO, I'm not the labor law specialist. If I look at, at uh, what Aida is uh, saying about um, all of these uh, risks and risks assessment, we also need to look at how the mechanics of the AI Act and the GDPR are envisioned and work, which is the AI Act it is high risk and then subsequently you need to carefully look at what these risks are and what the AI actually is because the definition of AI does indeed include very very modern day deep learning techniques which could use data from uh, from the work floor to train an AI to arrive at conclusions uh, that's one aspect on the other uh, end is also um, uh, individuals inputting rules into a rule system which uh, arrives at conclusions which is much more predictive and and almost looks like a regular manager who's observing so there's a spectrum there which we need to uh, acknowledge as well and this has to do with the fact that it's called the AI Act but actually the AI Act is becoming the act of all automated processing and not necessarily the decision making then if we go to GDPR um, the EDPB, triggered by GDPR itself, has come up with a list of high-risk processing activities already. Uh, various DPAs have done so as well, and it's completely possible to add to that, and some of them do actually rope in what's there. And a DPIA, uh, this is not data protection, this is about protection of humans, need to involve all fundamental rights. GDPR is not a privacy law, and I'm not going to explain that to this audience, I would do elsewhere. So it's really important that we reconcile all fundamental rights through the use of data with the wide spectrum of technologies which includes AI, but also includes spreadsheets. So very important to, to, to like it, look at it like that, and to have it in your company organized like that. So that, the, and then if you've done that, then what you need to do for the platform work directive, however it, it, it shows up, um, will be um, adding the, the diversity of the national flavors of employment law, which I think we all want because uh, Sweden thinks differently than France or, or Malta. So, I would actually say, if you look at it from and how can we protect the individual and what are the tools, it's there. Let's get it sorted. Uh, thank you, thank you, Simon, for that. Um, and uh, indeed, GDPR as a data protection law aims to protect you know the full spectrum of fundamental rights. Um, Diego, you, you wanted to to uh, pick up this point, uh, I, yes. I presume. Uh, first, uh, um, every time I have the, the chance to, uh, thanks Simon for the reminder that uh, GDPR is not a privacy law because every time I have the chance to remember that we have the e-privacy regulation that has been blocked for uh, five, six years and so here are my calls to adopt it as soon as possible. Thank you Member States for doing it soon. Um, that said, um, I agree with, um, with what Paul said and, and that this uh, AI Act and the Platform Works Directive they aim uh, at uh, dealing what uh, has been called uh, surveillance capitalism, some other just, some people just call it capitalism, capitalism. <laughs> but in, generally, I think it's a good way to, to start to target this business model. We've been targeting uh, uh, platforms such as Facebook, uh, YouTube, Google, and so on. Uh, probably Uber, Deliveroo, and the rest are next. Um, and the issue of different harmonization that Simon was uh, commenting, I, I agree, there has been the different implementation, there, there are good examples as well, the, the rider law in Spain, for example, has been uh, uh, quite warmly greeted by trade unions. Even some companies have, uh, have uh, gladly accepted and the way, uh, the, 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 the opportunity to give transparency to workers, I believe it is uh, just it, the, the one that has been giving all this transparency to riders and even has regularized the workers and the riders as workers uh, while Deliveroo has not. So I think that they are good examples of good companies doing the right thing. On the integration of the GDPR, I'm um, also agreeing with, uh, with Paul on, uh, on the issue that GDPR also is for workers. In fact, um, our member, NOIB from Austria, Max Trems uh, organization, they did a, uh, an action recently with the Uniglobal Union where um, they did a collective data request uh, to Amazon. 
And so I think it's a, a good way to, for the uh, digital rights groups and trade unions to start working together towards a common goal. Um, I also wanted to pick up on what Aida said that the, um, the, on the issue of the, the, in the previous drafts of the AI Act, all forms of employment were uh, classified as high risk. I wasn't aware of that, so I would also like to go back to that draft. And um, yeah, generally, uh, as a last point, um, I'd like to, uh, for the AI Act, in the, now that's being uh, uh, discussed in the parliament, to, to give the chance to work as, as representatives when uh, conducting AI risk assessment uh, that they, they have the, 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 the way to, uh, possibility to, to give voice, to, to interact with the, with the company, to be able to be part of that decision. And, and this does not come directly from the company saying, okay, we, we, are, we, we, are, we are compliant, uh, our AI is magnificent, and we do not uh, exploit workers, therefore everything's fine, no. Uh, please, uh, we need to have the trade unions present at the table. That's it from me. Uh, thank you, uh, Diego. Um, we were aiming to address also the power of data collection in the context of uh, employment um, and um, you know, the application of, of the GDPR principles by the employer. Um, are some red lines needed there? And this is a question for the panel. Um, and um, I'm, I'm, um, if you want to, to weigh in here. Um, is the AI the right framework to deal with uh, the AI Act, um, the right framework to deal with um, a, a ban of, of um, um, such data collection? Um, what would be your take on that? Aida or Diego again? I just spoke. I uh, feel yes. like I'm. Uh, Learning if someone wants to speak, well, uh, is the AI Act in the right place? Uh, well, probably it is, and there's, uh, as um, we were saying already, I mean, it's already in Article 5, it's in Annex 3. Uh, so I think it's part of the, in the, the right way to, to try to ensure that the automated decision making that, uh, uh, that is uh, done that is, that is, um, with AI based systems and they need to be regulated by the AI Act. So that's a very uh, quick uh, re reply from me. And, and also the platform work workers are active from a different point of view. It's going to bring some, some transparency to what's called algorithmic management. So that's also going to bring uh, more, more transparency and more, and more power to, to trade unions and people at work generally. Yes, Aida. But, but is indeed uh, there's a huge data collection in the context of employment, whether workers know that or not. And uh, an example is, of course, platform work, where workers are being measured by everything that they do, they don't do. The speed, task allocation, evaluation, price, wages, uh, if they are queuing or not, uh, if they are being suspect of fraud, whatever. Everything is a measurable point, and everything can be, um, in principle, being damaging uh, or producing significant negative effects on their individuals. So we know the platform, what's happening on platform work very well, because it's the most visible uh, data collection if you want. But there are other workplaces that you and me do not know because they are, they are, uh, they're private industries and it's very difficult to get into the employers and to say, tell me what, how much data do you collect from your employees and what you do with that. With that. That's very difficult. And, but we know that because of some complaints uh, from employees that this has been happening. Example, a few years ago, the case of H&M. Uh, in Hamburg, where the Data Protection Authority found that disciplinary measures were uh, being given to employees because managers had illegal access to a whole amount of uh, personal data, including if, whether they were having cancer treatments or going on holidays and dismissing people. A consequence, the DPA of Hamburg fined uh, H&M services for 35 million euros because of illegal use of such a powerful data collection. It's not the first case in GDPR that this happens. Also, not, not billing spring, sorry for the very bad German pronunciation, uh, company producing um, paper and yes, also received a 10 million fine because of illegal use of data collection of workers' uh, data in the, in the context of employment. And so there are other cases that you can find that. We have also case law. 
uh, from the European uh, um, Court of Human Rights, Barbulesco, uh, a year ago in Romania and Montenegro, another case always for the employer misusing uh, or having illegal access to what the employer, employee is doing with his private email or, or uh, uh, whether uh, cameras are being used, are, are used to, to monitor illegally or abusive uh, use of monitoring workers in universities when teachers lecture or in some other workplaces. So there is a lot of evidence. Uh, we have fines. We know that this data collection sometimes can be <laughs> oof, uh, a little bit abusive. So I hope that with, GD, uh, with G, the interface between GDPR and the AI Act, we can do something and data protection authorities will be more uh, smart and collaborate with, um, with labor authorities in order to cross-fertilize each other and help each other in order to prevent that this, is, this, this abuse of using and processing data is, beco is becoming a trend. Thank you. Um, I would like to turn, turn to Paul and to pick up on, on um, this experience with existing case law under the GDPR. Paul, do you think that the GDPR is underused in, uh, to tackle these imbalances of power um, and um, the, in the employment context? Uh, if so, why? Or um... Yes, I, I think absolutely it's underused. Um, <clears throat> I think that's why I said in my last contribution, and uh, we have also produced a paper on this. Uh, I participated at the F uh, Foundation of European Policy Studies a paper in which we said now it's time to start using it. I mean, unions have to get smart on using GDPR uh, uh, to defend uh, workers' rights. That's, that's absolutely clear. But I would say, um, a little bit in, in the spirit of Simon, um, the uh, problem on AI is, of course, the intransparency that we don't understand what the program is doing and how it functions. But uh, the documentation duties in the high-risk categories, they provide a lot of the material which then will allow the shop stewards or also the DPAs and DPOs and so on to understand, you know, which data is being collected. So. So we have an epistemological problem with, with AI. We don't know what it is doing, how it's evolving, and so on. And this will be solved if the AI Act is properly applied, because knowing all this is important uh, also for other purposes than protecting the workers. But it will be a side effect also for the application of GDPR. I mean, in fact, you know, it's very difficult to apply GDPR properly if you don't know uh, uh, what uh, uh, the AI is actually collecting and, and how it is processing the data and for what purposes and how this actually perfectly works. So uh, um, I think we, we therefore we, we are making progress but what I'm worried about is is that it, um, in our socialization and already in the discussion on this panel it sounds like it's completely normal and there are only just these pockets of you know where you shouldn't be observed and where the data shouldn't be used but in, in the old times, pre-digital, where the technology just didn't exist to constantly observe workers in all their movements of life at the workplace, um, the, uh, there was a principle which was that it's just it's forbidden to observe people constantly. And algorithmic management of people, uh, you know, I don't know whether it has discontinuity. Um, and certainly the technology makes it possible to do a perfect workplace surveillance in all aspects, including with all the parameters of analysis of the personality, and it's not only the face recognition, it's everything. And I think we need to be very clear about that this is forbidden in most member states. Uh, in, in Europe, I would say it is forbidden under normal labor law. In America, it's not. And, and that's our problem again. You know, we have here a rift between the two sides of the Atlantic and all these technologies and these potentials, they come to us from, these, uh, uh, from America, from the American companies and, uh, and we have to say, look, you know, we have very different principles here. We have these traditions of labor law where it is not okay, pre-digital and post-digital, to have a complete observation of what the worker is doing all the time at the workplace. And this is, these are the cases about 
you know, for example, using your email for private purposes. Um, in America, no expectation of privacy can be looked at all the time. Not so in Europe, unless there's a legal base. You know, of course, if you work in, uh, in banking and, you know, there's a risk of insider trading, the law says it is allowed to monitor the emails, but otherwise not. And uh, I think, um, you know, it's not only about European pride and it's not about digital sovereignty in terms of chips. Digital sovereignty also means that we maintain our traditions of framing technological power and employers' power over people, over humans, and that we continue to be proud about what we have achieved in this framing and frame it also into the future. And that's also part of the purpose of this legislation. So we don't have to go with our head down. On the other, on the contrary, part of digital sovereignty means uh, also that we must maintain these democratic uh, law-based traditions of saying stop not further, also at the workplace, the human doesn't become a slave. The human still is a, a citizen of a democracy who has rights, and um, a democracy doesn't end at the workplace. Um, can, can I build on that? Because, uh, yes. Yeah, because, um, Paul, um, you're referring to um, the difference between let's say, a capitalist market economy and a social market economy. And this actually, for me, was actually the reason why I joined Uber, to help explain that difference in San Francisco, in, in the rooms there. And this is why I find it so utterly amazing and even frustrating that actually four of our comp competitors in Europe, who are European incumbents, have been put forward on the spot um, by data protection authorities in Germany and Italy and courts in Italy exactly for doing the things you're doing while uh, we work and that's where my role also is a, as a DPO to explain why that's not allowed and have different technology in place so um, you know and apparently we haven't been transparent enough but the more tr the, how transparent I, uh, I, I or uh, Uber tends to be uh, it actually raises the question of trust. Do we trust American and Chinese companies, even if they're completely transparent uh, and not, and we s apparently trust European companies until they brought to justice? That's, that's my frustration here currently at this table. You know, doing the right thing, working very hard on that, and then subsequently, um, yeah. And, and, and I'm not saying it's good enough. Lots to improve, and, um, but being very restrained in, in indeed the monitoring, the surveillance, but also being monitored very fiercely by data protection authorities, which I am, I'm fine with, but okay. And the four cases you mentioned uh, are all on the basis of the GDPR. Uh, yes, the decisions they are in your made. report actually. Indeed. The uh, FPF report, I should say. You can find them. <laughs> yeah. Um, indeed. Um, but hey, uh, let, me, let me be clear, it may very well be that there are judges who will uh, judge differently than what I'm saying here, and then we'll learn and adapt, of course. Um, we will move uh, to, to questions from uh, the public. Uh, I just wanted to add that even in America, <laughs> things are, are truly changing. Uh, we have seen um, a bill proposed in California, of course California is al uh, always uh, the leader with these things, that uh, aims to provide transparency uh, in um, uh, monitoring of workers, uh, surveillance of workers. Let's see where that goes. But then also uh, very recently actually in the state, uh, well in the city of New York, um, a uh, bill passed uh, um, to regulate the use of AI in um, employment decisions, and it technically forbids the use of AI in employment decisions uh, unless there is a bias audit that has been conducted in the past year, um, and it's supposed to enter into force uh, January 1st, 2023. So, uh, yeah, I, I would say that even in the US, we are going towards uh, into a more protective direction. Um, let's start the Q&A session. Uh, and please uh, introduce yourself when, when asking. Not yet. I'm Eike Greif. I work in DG Justice of the Commission. 
uh, also working on the fundamental rights dimension of the recent AI proposal. And I have a question or an invitation to AIDA. Uh, you mentioned that the Annex 3 category relating to work could be described as risks relating to algorithmic management, but that it might not cover all risks in uh, a work or employment context. And then you mentioned the cobots, which I assume it's not my area of expertise, would fall under the product safety part in Annex 2. Um, and that was one example. But of course, if you have more examples that are not currently addressed in Annex 3, but where you have like empirical evidence that there is a risk, really now is the time to say it and to, to raise it because it's discussed by the co-legislators. And it's either a question or an invitation because if I would sit there and I'm being asked to produce examples, I always have a blank in my head and I forget everything, although I would have the examples. So even if not now, at any time, if there are more examples, it's really very welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Do you want to add a comment? Yes, absolutely. 70% of, uh, according to Deloitte, 71% of people analytics is a priority for every employer. This is the Lloyd figures. I have examples in the financial services uh, assessing the empathy of workers vis-a-vis uh, -vis high level clients. As I mentioned, I have examples of call centers. Uh, call centers uh, workers are spread all over the world, being not all, only algorithmic management, micromanaged by the second, and there, yeah, these but workers are, would be covered. yes. But what I, I think what Eike is looking for are the examples where you allege that, that there is no algorithmic management. No, no, yes. but, 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 but I mean, I, I, I have to yeah. say, sorry, uh, Aida, you know, it starts with the wording, doesn't say algorithmic management. Please read out the wording. I, mm -hmm. I, I searched it now on my mobile phone. That's why I was fiddling. I didn't find the wording. The wording is work relations and performance management. It's very broad. So, um, I mean, let's not pretend that there are words. It, it, the, 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 the annex doesn't say it, uh, the high risk is only algorithmic management. It doesn't say that. And I think you have to take the legal for proposal for what it is and not read into it some intentions, uh, you know, in comparison to the white paper and this and that. I mean, the wording is extremely broad and we have to take the wording as it stands there. And um, so um, th the question anyway was, what are the examples where you fear, based on existing wording, that it's not covered? Because I think the intention, of the, uh, at least of the Commission, is to cover it. There is no intention to carve out anything, and we need to understand it. But of course, it's a very difficult discussion if you pretend that there are words which are limiting, which are actually not there. I totally understand you, uh, Paul, but I have studied a lot of definitions on algorithm management, and all of them very much look like the uh, paragraph 1 and 2 of Annex 3.4, which describe uh, the context of employment and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. It's just that they look like algorithmic management. I didn't say it's, it defines only algorithmic management. And I think and I believe it, it's just there could be some other cases that we can discuss. And thank you for the invitation that could be just not falling in and hence not be covered. But we can discuss that with some examples that I have. Maybe we can discuss that later. Uh, I just wanted to, to say that that definition looks very similar to what we describe as algorithmic management in the literature, privacy and labor and everything that so far has been written on the topic. Thank you for that. Thanks. Thank you, Aiken. Hello. Hello, I'm Nicolas Blanc, I'm national delegate for, uh, for a trade union in France whose name is uh, CFECGC. Thank you for the presentation. I'm also, I'm also a part member expert of uh, GPI for the future of work. So I would like, uh, I think um, AI Act is a top down regulation. And uh, don't you think we need uh, a bottom up regulation? For example, with social dialogue, I think it could be useful to complete the, the dispositive. I think it could be an interesting thing. I have another point for another question for the DPO of Uber. I think Uber is the worst uh, company in the world for workers' rights. So I would like to know uh, what do you think about the portability, for example, for workers' rights. I think it could be very useful for, to defend their the, the own interests. Thank you very much. Uh, Michel, do shall do I? you want to start with Yeah, let, let me, let me uh, um, give an answer to that. Um, uh, 
I have no specific opinion on portability rights, other than that it is very important to also recognize that um, in our case, the transactions are two or three sided. So if we provide uh, drivers or data intermediaries with all of the data related to a trip, we would also deliver the data related to the passenger. Not necessarily identifiable, but pick up drop off with timestamp mapped on a map can reveal a lot about the individuals, in particular when, for instance, such a location is in a washing clinic. So I'd be really cautious about looking at what GDPR already says, the rights of others. So I am, uh, based on GDPR, okay with uh, uh, the right to portability to deliver the data to, or, or the right of access in a machinery, uh, in an electronic format to, uh, to the individual, but I'm very, very, very cautious about um, creating a, a large database uh, at some data intermediary. By the way, currently in the transportation sector, various cities and countries are enacting these laws. For instance, currently in this city of Brussels, uh, all taxi companies are going under an obligation, if the Brussels Parliament says okay this month, to deliver full trip information to a central database. So to me, that resembles at the local level in Brussels, mind you, where uh, about 40% of the trips taken by taxis are conducted by non-Belgian people, for obvious reasons, creates an amassing of data which could be very, very sensitive, particularly when it's in near real time. That's currently happening in, uh, in Brussels and elsewhere, and to me that looks like telecommunications data retention or passenger name records, without the name, but still the passenger records. So I am very, very hesitant in my role as DPO, advising on rights of not only the drivers, but also, in my case, the passengers, the restaurants, and even indirectly their staff, as well as those where uh, the deliveries are being made, on their rights. So, and, the and, and that's a very, very important uh, topic to... Yeah, but uh, the question, I think, wasn't the question about the transfer of the workers? Uh, the points and, and the, the workers' performance records so that they show can show you know what a great driver they are. Sure. Wasn't that your question? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Sure. Thank that, you. That, that's fine. If they exist, that can be done. Could yeah. you answer to my question, please? <laughs> yeah. No, but I, I do want to. I did want to make clear because transparency, in, 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 transparency, in, yeah. it's very important. You know that yes. AI Act yes. is very important for that. So I yes. I think Uber must for for uh, uh, workers uh, request you have to answer quickly and yeah. you have to do that yeah. i think you have to explain your your algorithm it will be mm -hmm. very complete with the dsa something like that you, you will yeah. you have you will have to do it okay All right. yeah no no but, but let me let me uh, uh, explain we have that explanation on how, for instance, the matching of rides and drivers takes place. And one of the things uh, um, that is always surprising is that we have very little in that kind of a, a, a personnel file. For the, exactly the reason Paul lambasted us for just now, because we have not been regarding them as employees, but as independent contractors. So actually, there's a lot of data minimization going on internally. Yeah, that's, that, this is just a fact, what I'm stating. You can disagree with the fact that it's the case, but that's the reality. So we also have to realize that uh, uh, if you are a worker, all of a sudden, uh, certain restrictions related to instructing or collecting data um, need additional rethinking, exactly what Aida uh, was saying. That's when these, these rights need to be triggered. Uh, yeah, so it, it, there are some, some complexities underneath which we really need to, to realize. I, I see two strong reactions coming from the, that part of, of the panel. So let's start with Diego. Well, I mean, this of uh, Uber and giving all the transparency to workers, it was too easy to not say anything. Uh, especially this week when um, there was a hearing in the, in the courts in the, in, the, in the Netherlands where I, the lawyer is around so he can give more uh, information, but we heard about uh, Uber drivers uh, crying in court not knowing why um, they had been terminated and why they didn't have access and couldn't work for the platform anymore. 
Uh, so <laughs> it's good that they have so much uh, transparency, but you have to go to court apparently still. Perhaps it's your hobby. Um, so I don't think so. And then um, on the bottom up legislation, um, I'm not sure that concept uh, exists, but I, I do believe in, in bottom up confrontation. So <laughs> as I said before, I think the role of trade unions and here uh, digital rights groups like Edri can help is in building this relationship in helping you with the technical part, with the access to data requests, uh, doing litigation. We have done uh, litigation on data protection for years. So I think that's the only way to do it. Um, and, the, and the legislation, whether we like it or not, I'm, 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 I'm a lawyer, I practice law for many years. It's always um, uh, top down. And, but uh, the way you gain rights usually is not top down, it's usually fighting and, and confronting I mean, big companies like Uber and others. Um, Aida, do you want to yeah, add something? Well, thank, thank you. I, I'm sorry, Simon, but I was surprised that you said that there is little, very little data in the files of workers when, when it's the reality that so many workers have been uh, initiating trials upon the different courts mm -hmm. in order to, to, to exercise first ex their rights. And second, we know uh, as a result from these uh, cases that Uber has collected a lot of data. No, but uh, I, I was uh, saying performance data. That's different from, uh, for, from there. there's a lot of data. That's not what I'm uh, negating. Yeah, so it's not like there is a regular uh, performance file. It simply doesn't exist. I have not been able to find it, and I can go everywhere. So that's, that's yeah. the reality. Oh, this is why you wanted to react to Diego's point on, yes, on the I trial, I or Simon? No. Um, I, I don't think it's my role to comment on trials as a DPO, because I'm not part of those proceedings. Great. Uh, you were at, at, at the hearing, weren't you? I was an observer. Okay. Um, yes, maybe a question from the floor. I give it to myself. No, uh, thank you for, um, very much for this debate. It's really, uh, my, and my name is Mario Guglielmetti. These are my concerns. First of all, thank you for this debate. It's the debate we really need to have. The situation we start from, as you frankly and bravely said, is a situation of power asymmetries. It's a situation in most cases of uh, exploitations. And this is said by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Review, the MIT Review, for example, relating to, the, to Amazon Turk and the wages provided by Amazon Turk with the bidding systems uh, using AI and algorithms. So this is the starting point. How to remedy this point? First of all, yes, we are, there are things which, that should be banned and are there in the Artificial Intelligence Act. We have the polygraph, we have emotional recognition of refugees, we have uh, um, um, uh, a, a lot of things, predictive police and uh, the parliament, Libe, said, please shift this into, into banned. So this is uh, it's, it's not all perfect there. Uh, then we also have the issues of interplay. The interplay with the platform uh, work directive is not clear at all with the Artificial Intelligence Act. In the platform work, we have the ban, the prohibition to use emotion recognition for platform work. We don't know if a system which provides uh, emotion recognition on the workers can be certified according to the Artificial Intelligence Act because the lack of emotion recognition is, one, is not one of the parameters to be checked before the providers can provide the declaration of conformity uh, to EU rules and therefore put the CE mark. Then we would have a CE mark in practice because we have to face practical situations. Will we have a situa situation where we will have the CE mark on a software which provides for emotion recognition or, uh, and, on employees? I think uh, with the current law as it stands, this is a situation we, we might have and will put shame on the CE mark. Or other in case we cannot use the product, however, we will put in, in the, at the very least a situation we are uncomfortable with. Then we have a situation of incompleteness of the Artificial Intelligence Act because we don't have the sectorial authorities involved and we don't have the sectorial laws in it. In the, we have uh, two sets of DPS comments on credit worthiness and on also the comments, this one, on platform work, which says not only data protection but also the parameters, the applicable rules should be looked at when providing a certification. And this is uh, not an abstract uh, thing. We are referring to very specific system, for example, credit worthiness systems. We are referring to uh, work management systems. So it's not something which is completely different uh, in, in, in life and, and in practice. And then we have the fourth and last issues, which is GDPR. 
GDPR, we are at risk in a situation that the GDPR is used as a metastasis, as something which goes uh, uh, without uh, um, uh, not only having this useful effect, for example, when it's the case of macro management of expressions and uh, uh, in-depth surveillance of the worker, which can be uh, disallowed based on GDPR, but we must remember that GDPR is functional to other rights as well. When we think about Article 22 of uh, automated decision making, it's not the end of the story. We have to check, for example, if uh, the electricity bill uh, is wrong because the electricity consumption has been calculated automatically in a wrong way. We should be able to go to the sectoral competent authority. We should be able to have checked the sectoral laws applicable in the case of electricity consumption. And the same applies to insurance. You know, the same applies to the banking se section. So here yeah, we have really the risk of going into the fourth industrial revolution, starting again with the battle of the second industrial revolution on minimum wage, on maximum working time, and so on and so forth. And this is a very concrete risk we are, we are running now. Thank you. Is there's no, was there a question as well? Or very clear statement, I think. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, are, is there another question? Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for um, the conversation. Uh, I'm Jill from the University of Amsterdam. Um, I think I have maybe a broader question um, for all of you working in this field, uh, which is right when I think we're talking about capitalism, regardless of what modifier you put in front of it, um, exploitation at work and precariousness, outsourcing, peace wages is very implicit in that feature. Um, I think Uber runs very much on, on that. Um, but I think that I wanted to ask in general with regards to the different forms of European regulation coming out. So to GDPR, the AI Act, uh, the Platform Work Directive, but also regard, regarding like the Data Governance Act, Data Act, etc. If we were to meaningfully um, think about labor, which I think Paul, you said there's a turning to labor now. Um, what does it mean when, for example, pushing for AI also requires, for example, forms of exploitation to clean data sets? Uh, and this is, has kind of like been, been talked about click work in terms of uh, giving this data to, to developers and, and people creating this. Um, so what do you think, I guess, on a European level uh, is taking this labor perspective seriously? Um, because these are constantly outsourced to different forms of platform work. And, and this, I think, is really just the beginning of that you see it. It's very explicit. But any technological innovation at this point requires so much human labor and exploitation. So what would your yeah, response be to this in terms of genuinely taking a labor perspective? Thank you. Does anyone want to comment? Maybe. Yes, um, I think it's a, a, a very valid point, but at the same time, you know, one law cannot solve all problems of this world. So we are now discussing here three pieces of law which have a certain purpose. Uh, this per, uh, issue of the outsourcing, in, in particular into developing countries uh, where people are being exploited and do the handwork uh, for AI, um, is, let's say, you know, if they are not platform workers as such and, and don't fall under this uh, directive, which I would have to check now, um, is probably, you know, right now not on the radar of these three pieces. But we have other uh, legislations, and, and that's why I'm pleading for a holistic view of, uh, you know, labor law being mainly a matter for member states in any case. Uh, one has to look um, at these pieces of EU law which are coming now in the context of where they will be used. And uh, we have another, just to give you an example, we have an initiative, a legislative initiative for a sustainable corporate government's due diligence where we want to make sure that labor law standards are um, respected in the supply chain. And what you are describing is, in, in principle, is the supply chain of artificial intelligence. Now, I would have to check that proposal, which, whether it actually also covers this type of supply chain constellation in making software, or whether it's only related to products, which are sort of, you know, not just virtual. Um, we are in a learning phase uh, in this new world of digital 
uh, work division all, all over the world and we are in all these fields we are dealing with cutting edge new issues and uh, that's why such discussions as today are so important but it's also important not to stall the progress of laws getting accepted because they are not perfect you know because that is also one of the classic arguments of the silicon valley lobbyist this law is no you cannot enforce it this law is no good we rather want a good law uh, we rather want no law than then you know if if we don't get a good law we want no law well you know i mean that's the reality is we can't right now make this one law which solves all problems of this world so I think your point is valid. I will have to go back and check a little bit. But um, even if it's not addressed, and even if, you know, I don't know whether we could still have a discussion on this in the Parliament and the Council, I would still say the three pieces of law which we're discussing, they, sh they should move forward. Thank you, Paul. Sebastian? Maybe, uh, thank you, first of all, Sebastian Barjval from uh, the Future Privacy Forum. Wonderful panel. Uh, I love the fact that there was so much disagreement, just shows the importance of the topic we're covering today. Um, and my question is around the Platform Workers Directive, precisely, because in the initial commission proposal, we see that transparency duties for uh, platforms in this regard are increased when you, when you compare them with the GDPR. So if you look at uh, the types of uh, automation that is involved here, we see that also uh, regarding semi-automated decisions, so decisions that are taken by a human following an algorithmic recommendation, these are also covered in terms of the transparency you have to give to workers. And you, workers have the right not only to be informed about how the system works, so the system level explainability, but also at the decision level. Why was I labeled or affected in a specific manner in this specific case? So I'm wondering, is this the recognition, first of all, why only for platform workers and not other contexts, first of all? And second, is this the recognition from the Commission that the transparency in the GDPR regarding algorithmic decisions is not enough or broad enough, that maybe in the future we need to broaden the scope of Article 22 or the transparency duties relating to algorithmic decisions? So this is my question. I'm looking at, at Paul primarily. Yeah. Um, I don't have an easy answer to this, um, but um, I would say the justification to have some elements of higher levels of protection lies in the very precarious uh, situation of the platform workers and the relationship, the special relationship, which you already mentioned, at the workplace, but here even more, you know, it's not a, it's not a standard workplace where you have the normal protections of labor law, but uh, even sort of, you know, even more power uh, for for the the guy who offers the work um, in in relation to the person who has to sell its workforce. I think that is the justification. Is this a recognition uh, um, that uh, the other standards in 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 GDPR are not high enough? I wouldn't say so because it's a lex specialis for a special situation. But we may well learn uh, in the course of things in these discussions and working with the empirics and so on, that maybe something needs to be done in the future, I would say the pressure would have to be very, very high to open GDPR again. Um, I am have been asked a number of times already during GDPR work, you know, why don't we do a special uh, regulation on data protection at the workplace? And my answer has always been, and this is uh, also relating to the colleague who said bottom-up, because of course in EU law we have this bottom-up process where the social partners can agree on a law and then the Commission proposes it like this. Um, this is the social dialogue mechanism, so that is bottom-up. And my answer has always been, well, uh, if social partners are able to agree on five points which we need to regulate for uh, data protection at the workplace, we will do it. But such an agreement is not forthcoming for evident reasons. And also in the member states which have tried to do special laws on uh, data protection at the workplace, they have normally failed. So from that point of view, uh, I would say the uh, uh, crowd working proposal, it's not as such a data protection law, but you're right, it contains elements which I would say marginally go above uh, GDPR. That would be a great step forward if we get this through the, you know, the Parliament and uh, and the Council. Thank you. 
thank you. Can you give There's James, James, uh, please, because he's waiting for. Yes. Uh, thank you, thank you, Simon, and um, uh, I, I'm James Farr from Worker Info Exchange, and we've been involved in bringing these cases in Amsterdam, but I, I'm not going to talk about that now. But I, I did want to to defend Simon a little bit. He's he's quite right. Some of the European companies have been horrendous, uh, like Bolt, uh, the um, rideshare app from Estonia, is, is almost as bad as Uber is. Uh, and also, um, Just Eat, Diego, have cut driver pay 25% since Christmas, uh, summary dismissals, and the intense algorithmic management that they do is, is almost unconscionable. And in fact, their data protection is loose too purposefully and that you now can buy an account on the black market in Portsmouth in the UK for 500 pounds. Uh, and, and I have to believe these companies know that this is happening and allow it to happen. My question is about um, consequence. Uh, if we're gonna have high risk um, classification for employment in the AI Act, do we have high consequence uh, for lack of compliance? And the reason I ask this question is that I've been involved in an employment case with, with Uber since 2015. We won the Supreme Court, but Uber cherry-picked what it wanted to comply with. So it's not complying with the UK Supreme Court. We still have four weeks of an employment tribunal on working time ahead of us in June. So seven, eight years to get the minimum wage, that doesn't work. Now in terms of voluntary action on portability, I mean, Simon's talking nonsense there because you know, Uber will give your data, all of this GPA data, to their commercial partners like Zigo Insurance Company, Cache. They'll, they'll give it to them, but they won't give it to the workers. Um, they'll give it to the police. Uh, when the National Police Chief Counsel in England um, defended Uber's license, not on the grounds that they were uh, filling a transport gap that was, was good for public order, but because they had become such a great source of intelligence. Uh, and giving the two, ta two and a half thousand Met Police uh, data requests without warrant. So it seems to me Uber can, can do this when it wants to, but when workers want their data, you know, Uber has this layered approach, this misleading approach, uh, leaving out key data in what they call event data is stripped of all events. Uh, and then when, when we as third parties or trade unions try to do subject access requests, try to get algorithmic transparency, uh, Uber refused to cooperate in, in that. And, and it's effectively, we've gone from a situation where we can't exercise rights to we, we Uber. We have one, one more minute. One minute. So you, Uber so and these companies a, actually we'll actively suppressing these rights. So when we come to the implementation of the EU AI Act, uh, what will the penalty be? Because a 35 million fine like H&M, I mean, this is loose change for Simon. I mean, what, what we need to do, prison sentences, death penalty, what, 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 we, what will we do, need to do to have the right consequences for a high risk processing and a lack of enforcement? Thank you. One minute, if you want to. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sitting here in my role as a DPO, which means that I also uh, am conscious of, of course, the rights of drivers, as well as the rights of others, and so on. Um, which means that I don't take the decision on what actually is happening, but I've been monitoring them, and we've been also, uh, I've been looking at how Uber has been doing this also in the context of the recently, uh, recent EDPP guidelines, and uh, I think it's in alignment with that. Now, whether or not that's okay, that will be part of this, uh, uh, of the judgment that will come out, uh, and, and maybe others. Then back to your question on enforcement. Um, any law is as good as its enforcement. It's as simple as that. So if the enforcement with GDPR is there, then it can happen. But then as a society, we also need to be willing to fund the enforcers. And we know that that's where, where with GDPR, we have a bit of a struggle, not because of the funding, but because it's very hard work to get 26, uh, 27, whatever, DPAs to get a line. That take, this is taking some time. And this is also where I think, uh, James, you're highlighting a, a worry we should have with the AI Act as well. What will the actual enforcement landscape look like and what will the actual uh, enforcing bodies be? It's, it's, it's out of focus and has been so far and uh, it helps me in my role as a DPO when it is crystal clear that if you do this, the fine will be like that. So last week EDPB churned out their uh, guidelines and uh, my reading is fines need to be dissuasive and whatever it takes will make it them dissuasive. That's my short version of what currently the DPAs have done. Uh, 
and you'll see the results. So if they come after Uber, I'm now pretty sure that if something is found wrong, there will be a steep fine. Very simple. It's going to happen. Now let's make sure that indeed works with the AI Act and Platform Work Directive as well, because money helps. Um, Absolutely. Thank you so much for a very engaging panel. Thank you so much to the audience, very engaging audience. And now we have a lot of topic of conversation for the cocktail, which awaits in the Grand Hall. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>